Welcome, 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 everybody. Thanks for joining us for week two of the Wealth Webinar Series that we're doing with Brent Kessler and myself. Uh, we're going to be going into all sorts of different topics regarding the money multiplier, the infinite banking concept, and how you can be the bank and use these strategies. So week one, if you missed it, if you didn't see week one, no problem. We can send you a recording of week one. That'll be no problem at all. Uh, matter of fact, you might have already got it when you registered for this. So the only people that will get the, the, re the uh, recordings of all six weeks are the people that are registered. Then after we're done with these, the six weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to put all six weeks on Money School TV, and it's going to be an entire curriculum. Probably, actually, not probably, absolutely going to be one of the most comprehensive trainings probably ever done on the infinite banking concept to the public. So you guys are witnessing a first here. So thanks for joining us, everybody. And just so everybody knows too, I'm going to be answering the chat. So right down below, if you guys look, there's a little chat box. I see some people chatting in. We got some people in from West Coast. But um, if you have questions as we get going, that's where you're going to chat in the questions. And I'll do my best to answer them all. And if it's something that I think that everybody should hear, I'll basically ask Brent to, you know, address that. And, you know, me and Brent will just banter back and forth. When we're all done at the end, if anyone has further questions, we can answer the questions there, or you can set up a one-on-one -on -one call with myself or Brent, which will tell you how to do that as we're done. So with that being said, welcome everybody from wherever you're at in the United States, or I think the world, because I know last time we had somebody from Australia. So we are expanding out there and it's pretty exciting to see. So with that being said, Brent, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, Chris. Fantastic. Thank you. And welcome, everybody, to webinar number two, week two of the six-part series that we're doing these every Wednesday, as Chris says, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And um, all right, so each of these are going to build up on the next one. So, you know, if this is, if you missed last week, you definitely want to get a recording of the first one. Um, because each of these are going to build up. So some of the stuff I might go through may be a little confusing and may not make a lot of sense because you haven't watched the first one yet. But anyway, just a reminder, who am I? Brent Kessler. The name of our company is The Money Multiplier, located down here in Port Orange, Florida, about an hour east of Orlando, right up next to Daytona Beach. And um, again, we're just going to continue the topic and talking about money, how to build your wealth, how to keep control of your money, how to pay off your debt and your expense, all without working any harder, without changing your cash flow, taking any additional risk or losing control of your money. And as we went over last week, you know, all we're really doing, guys, is adding one step in your financial life. That's it. Just adding one step. This is not, I'm not going to tell you how to invest your money, right? Um, again, so like a lot of you like investing in stocks or bonds or gold or silver, or Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, antique cars, houses, real estate, however you like to invest, is completely fine. This is the process of what you're going to do to make the investment. So you are able to recapture and recycle all of those dollars back. Um, I won't go in, you know, just to, um, again, just to my background, because I did that last time. But, you know, if uh, you guys remember, I actually had $984,711 of debt when I first heard about this. And I was able to use this concept, put this process in place, and I was able to pay that debt off in 39 months, three years and three months, simply by adding one simple step in my financial life. Now, I got to give credit to my mentor and the grandfather, the Mac Daddy, I call him, of the infinite banking concept, R. Nelson Nash. Nelson wrote that book called Becoming Your Own Banker. It's definitely a book that you want to add to your wealth building library. This book completely changed my financial life. So all of my teachings, and Chris would agree, I mean, this the background comes from Nelson Nash and his, um, as far as his service and how he taught us this concept. And also the book, okay, so the thing you can also get is two audios, two hours worth of audio. So if you're a little like me and have some ADD going on and don't like to sit down and read a book, you can listen to the audio. But I'm telling you, we read this book over and over, you know, and again, um, so like doing these, um, okay, so doing these six Wednesdays, so in a row has forced me, not that I need forcing, but it's forced me to go back and review and read the book again. And each time I read the book, I'm like, oh my gosh, 
I forgot about that. I forgot about this. I'm not telling my clients about this, right? So the more you get around the campfire and drink the Kool-Aid, the better this stuff gets. And um, I'm telling you, it's game changing when it comes to your money and finances. So you got to get that book. Now, if you have a choice of books to get, so make sure you get the book from Nelson Nash. But here's another book that Chris Noggle and I just wrote, just came out about a month ago called Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery. And um, there's, I, I think there's quite a few different ways to get that book. But if you go to our website, themoneymultiplier.com under the resources tab under book, you can order it uh, from there, order it on Amazon, or Chris can tell you how to get it as well. But uh, yeah, Chris real, and I real, real quick on that, Brent, I just want to let them know that we, for, we're, I don't know how long we're going to do this, but right now you can get the book for free. I've got a link that I'm going to put up in the chat. You can get the book for free. You just paid nine ninety five for shipping and we'll ship it out. And uh, so that's going to, that's only for now. So I'm giving that to every one of you because that offer is not going to stay on the table, but we did just start doing that. We want to get this out to as many people as possible. So I just wanted to do that. I'll, I'll put it in the chat for you guys. Okay. Fantastic. Great. All right. So anyway, guys, here's what we're going to do. Um, and again, the topic that we're going to talk about on all of these webinars that we do is All right. So money, that's what we're going to be talking about is money. All right. Um, so again, as far as talking about money, the thing we're talking about is how to build your wealth, how to grow your wealth, how to keep all the money in your family, how to pay the debts and expenses that you're already paying, and now you're able to get your money back for the products and services that you're already buying. And remember last week, I shared with you how we do this with a car. And I wanna go back to that car example, and I wanna just point out a couple things here on the car example that I did. So let me bring this up. Hang on, it's coming up here on the screen. Okay, now remember, the machine that we're using, oh, also in the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, if as we're going through this, and again, you probably wanna write this down now because I don't know if it comes up on too many more screens, but as I'm going through this, if there's more information that you want to know, all you need to do to schedule a call is text the word Brent to 33777, or I think you can also text Chris 3377. It doesn't matter who you talk to, Chris or myself, okay? So you might wanna just anyway, jot that down now. And, and again, you may find it useful um, at the end or down the road later, or you may not, but uh, I don't know how many more times this comes up, but Chris will probably share with you it at the end anyway. So anyway, all right, so let's go back to the car example. Now remember, okay, the thing that I did last week is I proved to you how you're gonna get all the money back on all the cars that you're gonna buy, drive, and own. So what that means is not only do you get the car, but you also now get the money back. And remember the machine that we're gonna be using to build our wealth, the machine that we're gonna be doing, the machine we're gonna use to do this, it is a whole life insurance policy in a mutual company that pays dividends, right? That's the vehicle that we're using. Now, why are we using a life policy to build our wealth? Because this is what the rich do, right? This is what the wealthy do. Remember from last week, the number one purchasers of whole life insurance in the world are conventional banks. Conventional banks own more in whole life insurance than all of their land and their buildings combined. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna mimic exactly what the wealthy do. So that is the machine that we're using. Because some people say, well, life insurance, I know everything there is to know about life insurance. No, you don't. Because if you did, you would already be doing this concept in your life and you would be calling in and telling us how this is working. All right, it, again, these are specifically designed and engineered policies for high cash value that you're gonna use right away, all right? Now, as I said, age doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter when we're talking about cash because we're not talking about the death benefit. We aren't focusing on death benefit, we're focusing on cash. Okay, so if you remember last week, and I used this example, and I showed you how you can get all the money back for all the cars you're gonna buy, drive, and own. So not only do you have the car, but you get the money back. Now, I wanna break something down here for you. 
And I just want you to kind of think of this illustration. I want you to look under this column as cash value available, okay? And all we're gonna do is we're gonna look and see what happens in five years, between year number eight and year eight, and actually year 13. And I want you to make believe that this is a bank account that you have at your conventional bank, wherever you bank at, the state that you bank at. I'm in Florida, so the Bank of Florida. Chris is in New York, so the Bank of New York. Whatever state you're in or city you're in, you all have a savings or a checking account that you put money into right now. I mean, I'm sure most of you do that are on this call, if not all of you, all right? So I want you to make believe that you have cash value available. I want you to look right down here in the eighth year where it says cash value available, and it says 73,226. Hey, Hannah, can you grab my calculator? Where it says 73,226, okay? Now, the thing we're gonna do in that account is we're gonna take out 25,000, okay? So if we have 73,000 in the account and we take out 25, how much do we now have? What is 73 minus 25? it is 48. Is that right? 48. So 73 minus 25 is 48. Now what we're going to do is over the next five years, we're going to put in 500 a month or $6,000 a year back into that account. So how much should we have in a regular checking account? Well, 73 minus 25 is 48. All right. Let's make sure I got that right. And it is 73 minus 25 is 48. And now we're gonna add over the next five years, we're gonna add 500 a month or 6,000 a year for a total of 30,000. So now if you took 48 plus 30, you should have in your checking account, you should have a total of $78,000, okay? Are you following me? So what we did, we started with 73, took out 25, so that means we're down to 48, and then over the next five years, we put in 30. So now this number right here should say 78, but instead, instead it says 95,000. Now tell me what number you would rather have. Would you rather have 78,000 in your checking account, or would you rather have $95,000 as cash value in your whole life policy that you can use just like you would use a checking account because you can take the money out, you can borrow the money out, right? So either way, it works, right? Either way, just like whether you have a checking account or whether you put the money into the policy. So the question is, is what number would you rather have? And I think all of you are probably thinking 95. I would much rather have 95 than 78. Well, really, my point to all of this is all you're doing is exactly what you would be doing with your bank account, right? Because, okay, because the thing you did is, okay, right here in year eight, you got 73,000 and you said, oh, I need to buy a car for 25,000. So you go take the 25,000 out of your checking or savings account, which now takes it from 73 down to 48. And now you're going to pay yourself back in your own checking account, 500 a month or 6,000 a year for a total of 30,000. So at the end here at year 13 in this example, you have 78,000 in your checking account. But when you add one step in your financial life and you do this through your whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends, you have 95,000. So really, ladies and gentlemen, we're not asking you to change what you're doing. We're just asking you to add the vehicle. Add the vehicle to what you're currently doing, right? That's all we're doing, is adding one step in your financial life. We're buying a stupid whole life insurance policy and we're using it for the banking system. Now, if you have gone, which we told you last week, if uh, you went to our website, themoneymultiplier.com, you scroll down to the bottom of the homepage where it says like members area, okay? And I have a downloadable attachment there that prints out these documents and it even goes further than 13 years. So it goes on every five years where you're buying a car every five years. And those numbers continue to get bigger, way bigger than if you would even 
way bigger. Okay. I, I mean, again, so like they even increased more. Like I said, in a bank account, you would have 78 grand. Okay. At year 13, but here you have 95,000. Well, guess what happens in the next five years? It even grows by a higher percentage, right? So the number or the Delta, the change, the difference is larger. The longer it goes, the more efficient it gets. Oh, and by the way, guess what else you have with the policy that you don't have with the bank account? Yeah, that column over there on the right that you see grayed out, the death benefit, right? So the death benefit, which we hardly ever talk about at the money multiplier, I mean, it is important. Yeah, it is, but we just don't really talk about it because if I solve your need for finance and cash, you'll have more death benefit than you can ever imagine. But you do have a death benefit attached to all of these policies. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is not a matter of if you're going to die. Now, a lot of you don't like the word die. And again, I don't really like the word die. I like to use the word graduate. You can use die, graduate, pass, right? Uh, whatever word you want. It's not an if you're going to pass, it's a when. It is a win because it is going to happen. Sometime it is going to happen. Well, remember the cash value in your policy continues to increase. The death benefit in your policy continues to increase. That's not me telling you. That is actually in your policy contract. That is stated in your policy contract. And you see all of that in your policy contract before you ever agree to accept the policy, right? So the death benefit then, okay, not if, but when you pass, that death benefit now goes to your beneficiaries tax-free. It goes to the beneficiaries, whoever you choose as your beneficiary, it goes to them tax-free. So a lot of people say, well, Brent, well, what about a loan? If I have a loan and I'm using money out of the policy, how does that work? whenever I pass, whenever I graduate, whenever I die. Well, let's look at year 13. And let's just say this was the day that you died, okay? And let's say you have $95,000. See the cash value, 95,000? Let's say you have all of that borrowed out on the policy. Well, look at your death benefit. Your death benefit is 840, right? Let's just call the cash 100 grand and let's call the death benefit 800 grand, just for easy math, okay? Just so I don't have to do all the math. So we'll say 800 in death benefit, and we'll say 100 grand in cash, all right? Close enough for government work. So now, the day that you die, the day that you pass, the day that you graduate, what happens is, is that $800,000 in death benefit is now gonna pay off the loan, assuming that you borrowed out the 100 grand, right? Now that's going to pay off the loan and your beneficiaries are going to get the difference. They're, so basically they're going to get 700,000 is going to go to your beneficiaries tax-free. Plus they get the assets that that loan just paid off. And hopefully as you've been practicing this, you have been buying assets with the money that you're using from your policy. I'm not saying you always have to buy assets, but hopefully with that loan, some of that you bought assets. So a loan on the policy is simply a prepayment of the death benefit. That's all it is. We are borrowing against the death benefit. So in other, so in other words, we're using the living benefits of the policy while we're living. You see, most people, when they think of life insurance, they think, oh, okay, well, life insurance will be good for my children, grandchildren, my beneficiaries. No, man, this is about you using this. This is about you using this money in your policy now. I mean, yes, there will be a death benefit, right? Okay, and, and if there is a loan, which hopefully, okay, so the day that you pass, you've totally maxed out your policy with assets and you're using the money, to do everything that you're gonna do while you live, and then your beneficiaries are still gonna be in great shape, right? So use your money. This is a way, and, and again, I know a lot of people, they're like, oh, you know what, when I just go home and when I leave and when I pass, I wanna make sure I keep care of my family. Absolutely, 
Absolutely. That would be great. Keep care of your family. But what about you while you're here? Why don't you keep care of yourself as well as we're going through this? Okay, so I just wanted to point that out. So as you're going through this, kind of look at that and see, oh, okay, well, I can put my money in a bank account or I can put my money in a policy, right? Now, again, this is long term. It's not, it's not right, okay, I'm going to do this for one or two years and then stop. No. No, this is something you're going to add to your financial life and you're going to continue to do it. If you have the mindset of like, I want to just do this for a couple or a few years and then don't do it anymore, then run. Hang up the phone, X out of the meeting and go do something else, right? This is not a get rich quick thing. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. Hey, Brent. If you listen to the audio version that Nelson Nash says, he says, he says in that audio version, he says, how about if there's a way that you can build wealth through your own debts and expenses that you already have. Because see, up to this point, here's what you've been doing. Every time you spend money, you take that money, right? You take that money and you buy products and services with it. You give it to someone else and in exchange, they give you a product or a service. But the money is gone. It's gone. It's totally left your family forever. When you run your money through this system, now, not only do we give the money to whoever we're buying the product or service from and they get the money, but now we have a system in order to get all the money back. So we not only have the money, but we have the product and service. And that's exactly what I went over and explained to you last week on the car, how to get all the money back on all the cars you're going to buy, drive, and own. And if you can do it with a car, guess what else you can do it with? You can do it with a... Uh, you could do it with a boat, a bicycle. You can do it with a cell phone, a computer, jewelry, furniture, clothes, um, a house. It doesn't matter. Your taxes, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're spending money on, you're now able to recycle and recapture those dollars. So not only do you get the product and service, but you also get the money back because now you have a system. Everybody should be in two businesses. Nelson Nash says this in the book. Everybody should be in two businesses. Um, and actually, I kind of thought of this right before I got on the call today. And I couldn't remember what page Nelson said that in the book. And, I, and again, I know this book pretty good. And anyway, I don't have my highlighted version of my book where I'm at today. So I'm scrambling through the book looking for it. And I couldn't find it. So if you guys know what page number it is, if you would share it. But if not, I'll have it for you next time. But Nelson says in the book, Everybody should be in two businesses. The business where you make a living, which that is is the job you do. I mean, whatever it is, wherever you're working, whether you work at Walmart, whether you're a CEO of a company, whether you um, are your business owner, that's the business that you make your money, right? Wherever you make money, that's one business you should be in. The second business is the banking business. And the banking business is the business that is going to finance everything you do while you live. Now, think about that for a minute, right? All of us are already in a business right now, whether it's our job. You might work at Walmart, Target. You might work at the bread company, the restaurant, the gas station. You may be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, whatever it is. You may be a real estate investor. That's how you're making your money right now, right? But now, what about the banking business? Are you in the banking business? Are you truly financing everything you do while you live? And the answer is probably no. So again, a lot goes into that. And I'm telling you, that Nelson Nash book, so like read it over and over and read it slow sometimes. And you can absorb every sentence that's in that book has great, great meaning. Okay. So we broke down the car example. Now here's what I wanna show you next, okay? And then after this, I'll open it up for some questions. But let's talk about, all right, how you spend your money, okay? Let's talk about how you spend your money. This is how most people spend their money and you're probably the same way, all right? Now, the thing that we do is we spend 20 cents of every dollar goes to automobiles. And I'm not saying just the cost of the car. I'm saying the maintenance, the gas, the upkeep, insurance. 20 cents of every dollar goes to automobiles. We spend 30 cents of every dollar goes to housing. We spend another 40 cents of every dollar goes to living. Everything that we do while we live. 
food, travel, entertainment, taxes, etc. And we're trying to save 10 cents or 10%, right? Now, are you guys aware of what the average savings rate in America is today? Some people tell me 0%, 2%, 5%, right? Well, as of about a couple years ago, the last time I looked at this, the average savings rate was about 5 to 6%. Prior to the previous recession, it was a negative number, but ever since then, people started to hunker down and they started to save more. So I'm going to say that you are saving 10 cents of every dollar, 10% of every dollar, which is, would be above average. But Chris Noggle told me, he says, hey, Brent, this is going to be an above average group we're talking here to today. So I'm assuming you guys are all above average and you're saving 10 cents of every dollar. Now, when most financial coaches, advisors, planners, so whenever they come and talk to you about money, they're not talking to you about the money that you're saving. They're talking to you about the money that you're spending, right? Uh, all right. Or, or, or no, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. All right. When most people talk to you, they're, they're talking to you about the money that you're saving and they're trying to get you a higher rate of return on the amount that you're saving. And in order to get a higher rate of return on what you're saving, that involves more risk, does it not? Yes. As a matter of fact, how are you liking the risk in the last couple months with your money, wherever you've got that saved, i.e. 401k, stock market, qualified plan? How's that been working out for you, right? So there's more risk associated with that. Well, here's where Chris and I are different. We're not going to talk to you about the amount of money that you're already saving. We're going to talk to you about the amount of money that you're spending. And if we can just take some of the money that you're spending, okay, which is basically 90 cents of every dollar, and if we move it into your savings category, then haven't we just increased your savings without working any harder, changing your cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control? Absolutely. So all we've done is take some of what you're spending, transfer it to your savings. So for example, I want you to take a look at the automobiles. Let's just say that we're spending 20 cents of every dollar that goes to automobiles, and now we knock it down to 15 cents, okay? So now, instead of 20, it's 15. Well, now we take that extra 5% or 5 cents of every dollar, transfer it over to the savings category. Now your savings category goes from 10 to 15%. Haven't we just increased your savings without working harder, changing cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control. All we've done is added one simple step. We've just transferred it over there. All right, let's talk about interest, okay? Interest that we pay to others. We spend 5% or 5 cents of every dollar goes to interest to other people, right? Now, every time we buy a car. Now, I know what a couple of you are saying. You're saying, not me, Brent. I don't pay any interest on automobiles. You know why? Because I pay cash for all my cars. I pay cash. And anyway, you guys tell me that. And, 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 and so it kind of give me a chest bump that you're proud that you pay cash. Well, let's really talk about paying cash and why you pay cash. There's only two reasons that you pay cash for a car. Number one is because you don't want to have any payments. And number two, you don't want to have any interest. That's why you pay cash for a car. Well, let's talk about those. Are those really true? Well, you tell me that if you pay cash for a car, you have no payments. Well, let me ask you this. Let's make believe we have a $20,000 bill and we're going to go buy a $20,000 car. Well, in order to buy the car and pay cash for it, you have to give the car dealer or the car salesman the $20,000, don't you? So you had to make one payment because you had to pay him $20,000. Or you could make 20 payments of $1,000 each, right? So either you make one payment of 20 or you make 20 payments of 1,000 each. Either way, you have a payment because even if you pay cash for that car and you make one $20,000 payment, the thing you have to do is automatically start saving right now for the next car, do you not? Because the car that you're driving or the car that you're about to buy, is that car going to last you forever? No. 
How many of you on this call or on your very first call you've ever bought, on your very first car you've ever bought driven around? No, you've went through cars, your second, third, fourth car. I mean, unless you're 16, 17, 18 years old, you're probably driving at least your second car. And you're going to continue to go through life and buy and sell cars. So how do you like to make payments? You want to just do them randomly or do you want to have them, have them systematically done? Hopefully you want to have them systematically. The second reason you pay cash is because you don't want to pay interest on that car. Well, is that really true? Look, imagine, I want you to imagine if you have a $20,000 bill, okay? And you go pay cash for that car and give them $20,000. You now had to give that $20,000 to the car dealer. That $20,000 is gone. It is gone. It has left your family forever, right? So even though in your mind you didn't pay interest on it because you paid cash, before you gave the $20,000 bill to the car dealer, that $20,000 was in an account somewhere that you controlled earning interest somewhere, was it not? So now you've just taken that away. You've taken that away, right? So you're no longer earning interest on that $20,000. See, as you learned last week, when we buy a car, and when we buy the car and we borrow the money from the policy, and remember, we're not borrowing the money from the policy, we're collateralizing our policy. We're putting up our policy for collateral and taking a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. So that means when I took 20000 to go buy the car, when I took it out of my policy, I didn't take it out of my policy. I put my policy up for collateral, took a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. So what does that mean? That means my $20,000 is still in my policy, compounding and growing at that guaranteed tax-free growth rate. Huge, absolutely mind-bending huge that will totally alter and transform your financial life for the better if you understand that. Let's go to housing. Look, you guys spend 25 cents of every dollar goes to interest to other people when you buy a house. Let's drive this home because it's important. A lot of you guys have house mortgages, do you not? All right, so let's just make believe that you have an interest rate on your house, three, four, five, six percent. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what percent, but let's just call it four or five percent for easy math, all right? So every month when you get in that statement and it says house payment due, it's generally the same payment every single month, is it not? Yes. And if you look real closely at that house statement, it breaks it down into two sections. It breaks it down into a principal section and an interest section. Now, I want you to look at your last house statement that just came in. And I want you to look at the interest part of that statement for this, okay, for this current month is the interest part of your total payment on your house, is it 5% of your total payment for this month? No, it's not. It's a lot more. It's a lot more than 5%, right? So again, it's not the interest that's killing you, all right? It's, um, again, it's not the payment that's killing you. It's the interest that's going out to other people right? So again, on the house, you're paying most of the interest in the beginning. As a matter of fact, 80% of your total house payment, over 80% of your total house payment goes to interest in the first seven years of a 30-year mortgage. I'll say that again. Over 80% of your total house payment goes to interest in the first seven years of a 30-year mortgage. How long does the average person stay in their house before they sell it or, re or refinance it. That's right, five to seven years. I want you to think of yourself. How long have you been in your house? How long have you been in? Some, I, I, I'm sure someone on the phone says, I've been in my house 25 years. Okay, great, you've been in your house 25 years. But how many times have you refinanced it in the last 25 years? Oh, I refinanced it twice. Okay, so that means you bought it once, you refinance it once, and then you refinance it a second time. So in 25 years, you've had three transactions. So 25 divided by three is eight. 
So your average would be eight years. And I said five to seven years is the average that people sell their house or they refinance it. So ladies and gentlemen, it's not the rate that's killing you because you got a good rate, four, five, six percent. It's not the rate that's killing you. It's that volume of interest that you're paying that's killing you. And all that money is where? Where's it going to? It's going to other people. It's going to the banks. And the last thing here is living. If you take five cents of every dollar goes to living expenses, everything you buy, five cents of every dollar goes to your living expenses. So what we're doing is we're spending 34 and a half cents of every dollar goes out to other people and we're trying to save 10 cents. Can you see how it might be a little hard to get off the financial hamster, financial hamster wheel doing that? Now, one last thing I'm going to show you before I take some questions from Chris and Chris or um, Hannah, help me with this right here. Bring me to the, um, I want to go to this page 26 right here. Page 26. And then we're going to open it up for questions. Bring that up for me. Hold on. All right. Yep. Page 26. Okay. Now this is page 26 out of Nelson's book. Hannah's bringing it up here. My rock star. Okay, look what page 26 says. Basic understandings. This is 26 of the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. You finance everything you buy. You either pay interest to someone else or you give interest up that you could have earned. So where do you want that interest going to? Do you want it going to someone else or do you want it going to an entity that you own and control? Remember, banking is a process. It's not a product. I said that earlier. It's not an investment. This is the process of what we're going to do to make our investments. Okay, Chris, I'm gonna throw it back to you for a minute and um, we'll go ahead and start taking some questions and then if there's no questions, I'll move on. And as I'm doing that, Hannah, I want you to bring up this right here. Next, who uses the strategy? Yeah, there's, there's yeah, I'm here. There, there's lots of good questions, lots of them. Um, so I'll start with this one. I was just typing up an answer, but this might be easier. You can hear me, right, Brent? I got you. All right. So I'm assuming we're paying the mortgage with loans from the policy, seeing as though I won't be able to take out the whole balance from our policy, which isn't exactly true. So I wanted to just throw that one to you. After you answer that one, there was a great question about the taxes and how the money. So right here, uh, let's see. It was something about the money that you use being taxable. So if you can just talk about how the tax advantages work with this. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. All right. Um, I guess the first thing that you asked is about so when you borrow money uh, from the policy, and I think you said you can't borrow like all the money you put in, right? Yeah, I think that's yeah. what they're saying. They're assuming. So, okay, well, that's a good question. Let's answer it. You're absolutely right. Okay, remember, I said this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. So it's long term. It's, it's long term. So if you remember, just from my presentation last week and I went over the money multiplier map and I was showing you when he puts in money, how much of that money he's available to use, right? Within the first 30 days. So as those, okay, so as the time progresses, you're able to use more and more money. So for example, here's the way that I like to describe this. So like if you put in a dollar, say today, let's say you have access to 55 cents of that dollar. Now the second year you put in a dollar and now you have access to 65 cents of that dollar. The third year you put in a dollar, let's say you have access to 90 cents of that dollar. The fourth year you put in a dollar, we'll say 95 cents. And then every year after that, when you put in a dollar, you have access to equal to and more than you're putting in. Now, all the money is yours that you put in the policy. You just can't borrow dollar for dollar out in the first couple years. But here's what I want you to think about. This is what really turned the light switch on for me. When I understood this, let's just say, for example, that I have a business opportunity for you, okay? And this is the guaranteed way that this business is going to work, all right? So I'm, so I'm gonna present you with this opportunity and I want you to tell me how much of this business you want, okay? Here's how the business is gonna work, okay? 
the thing we're going to do is we're going to start a business from scratch. And the thing we're going to do is we're going to put in a dollar into that business. And okay. So from that dollar, we're going to pay all the overhead of the business and we're going to be able to use 55 cents of that dollar in the first year. You're thinking, well, that's okay. I put in a dollar and I'm using 55 cents, not where I need to be, but it's a brand new business. I'm starting it from scratch. So now the next year you do the same thing. You put in a dollar into the business, pay all the overhead, and now you're able to use 65 cents of that dollar. And you're thinking, uh, not really where I wanna be yet, but it is going up, so it's going in the right direction, and I know the business is still new. Now the third year you put in a dollar, and now in the third year you put in a dollar, you've got 85 cents to use of that dollar. And you're like, hey, this is getting better. It's going in the right directions. I, I mean, I can see I'm making headway here. And now the fourth year, you put in a dollar and you've got 95 cents or almost dollar for dollar and you're paying, and now you've got all your overhead, you're paying all your overhead while you're doing this. And then from the next year on, from year four or five on, every time you put in a dollar into the business, you're gonna pay every, all the overhead and you're gonna have more than what you're putting in to the business to pull out. And that business is guaranteed to increase every single year. Like maybe year six, you put in a dollar, have a dollar 15. Year 10, you put in a dollar, have a dollar 40, right? It continues to increase each and every year, and it is guaranteed to do this. The longer it goes, the bigger the numbers get, all right? If you knew that you could start a business today, and that was going to get, be your guaranteed formula of the business, how many of those businesses would you like to own? How many would you like to own? And I'm hoping everybody on the call is saying, well, as many as possible. Absolutely you would. You would want as many of those types of businesses as possible because if you don't, you don't need financial counseling, you need severe psychiatric care, right? Well, that is exactly what this is. When you start a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends that's designed specifically and engineered specifically for this process, for the high cash value, the way we design them, that is what you're doing. You are starting a business from scratch. But guess what the cool thing is about this business compared to the one I just described? This business has no employees. It doesn't have anybody saying, hey, um, can I have some time off? It doesn't have anyone calling in sick. It doesn't have any employees bitching or whining about their schedule, right? It doesn't have any, it doesn't have payroll taxes and all of that stuff. There's no grass to cut. There's no, when the air conditioner goes out in your building, you don't have to maintain that. Your landlord, you don't have to deal with your landlord. As a matter of fact, this is a business that you only have to attend to 15 or 20 minutes a quarter. You can set it and basically forget it almost. 15 to 20 minutes a quarter. Okay. So it doesn't require your time. And on top of that, guess what? Let's just hypothetically say that Worst case happen and you died, say, in the second year of starting this business. Well, you're thinking, well, man, I died in the second year. So that means I put in a dollar and I took out the first year 55 cents. The second year I put in a dollar, took out 65 cents. So that means I got um, a dollar 20 of the two dollars I put in. You're thinking, well, that wasn't a good deal, right? Because I died early. Well, no, because guess what we're forgetting? We're forgetting the death benefit. So this business, this business is not only going to do everything I just told you it's going to do, but it's also going to give your family, your beneficiaries, your spouse, children, or whoever you want to be your beneficiaries, multiple, multiple, multiple times money that will go to them tax-free because of the death benefit. So is your spouse ever going to be mad? Is your spouse ever going to be mad at me? If, say, let's say you die in the first, second, third year, or whenever, it doesn't matter when you die, right? Is your spouse ever going to be mad at you for buying this like, stupid whole life policy in the mutual company that's designed and specifically engineered for this banking concept? Hey, Brent. Absolutely, they won't. So that's what you have to think about. Hey, Brent. 
Yep. Got another really good question. Uh, this is one that I think a lot of people would love to hear, and I get this all the time. It says, why would one pay off a car loan using a policy loan at 5 or 6% rather than using a 3% loan through a credit union? Credit union? I know the answer, but he just wants to hear you explain it because I've already gone over this with Eric. Yeah. The main thing is one key word, control. Control. When you owe somebody else money, they are in control, okay? Now, that's the key thing. Now, now, so does that mean that I'm not gonna use a bank to go out and finance something, especially in a low interest rate environment like we are now? Absolutely, I'm gonna use the bank. I'm gonna borrow money from the bank and I'm gonna be able to use my money, okay? And I'm gonna take advantage of some of those lower interest rates. But you gotta look and how is the interest calculated? Is it simple interest? Is it compounding? So you got to look at all of that. But I, and again, this is something that we're going to go in probably on the next session. I have it scheduled for either the end of today or the next session. We won't get to it today, but I'm going to go in and I'm going to show you how you can use a home equity line of credit in order to build more of these banking policies. So in other words, kind of think of it this way, even if you don't do banking policies, like just like we're talking about, the thing you want to do is you want to have access and be able to use your money. For example, um, so, okay, so like as far as equity in the house, is the equity in your house, how is it helping you right now? How is the equity in your home helping you right now? It's not. Somebody else is controlling it. So you're sitting there maybe with a lot of equity on the house and somebody else is using the equity. Could you go to a bank today all day long and borrow money from a bank, a home equity line of credit at four, five, or six percent. And yes, in this interest rate environment, absolutely, right? So could you, especially for our savvy investors out there, and I know a lot of real estate investors are probably on this call, could you borrow that money from a bank at five percent and go put it into something that's going to give you a 10 percent return? Maybe do a note, maybe do a fix and flip, maybe you know you're going to lend the money to someone else. Absolutely. Those deals are out there all day long. Call Chris Noggle. Chris Noggle will tell you, he'll turn you on to people that have those deals all day long if you want to earn 10% on your money and be in first position of the mortgage in the collateral. You have the collateralized position the same way the bank does on your house. So really, it's all about control. So I agree. And, and again, I'm going to throw this out there. And I know I'm kind of going back and forth a little bit. That's where my ADD comes in. But you guys will just have to deal with that because that's who I am, right? And I'm pure and I'm genuine and I'm going to give you what I got. For example, um, so two cars I bought. My last two cars I bought. I bought my wife's, um, let's see, I bought her convertible Camaro and I bought my F-150 truck. Well, had, again, I had the money in my policy, I could just go buy the car from my from the policy, no problem. And I could have played with it the same way, the car example, exactly that way, okay? And I could have paid myself back, borrowed the money from the policy, paid myself back, yeah. But instead, because the one car dealer was offering 1.9% interest and the other was offering 0.9% interest, and I'm buying about $100,000 of cars here between the two cars, right? I'm thinking, well... Okay, I'm going to take that hundred grand and I'm going to put it over here in this investment vehicle after it comes from my policy. Because remember, the money should go through the policy first and then go make the investment. That's the, that's the ideal thing. So now I'm going to take the money. I'm going to take a loan from my policy, okay, of the hundred grand. And I could have went and I could have paid cash for the cars. And then I could have paid myself back on the cars, right? But instead, what I decided to do is I decided to take advantage of the 1% and the 2% interest loan on the, okay, just from the conventional bank. So now I've given up control to the bank. I don't like it, but, um, but I, myself, I'm disciplined enough with my money that I can take back that control every time I want. So if the bank pisses me off or I don't like dealing with them anymore, I can take back control. But I chose to take their money and pay them back at the 1% and the 2%, and I took my 100 grand from the policy, okay, but I didn't take it from the policy, I put my policy up for collateral, so my 100,000 stays in the policy, and instead I took the 100,000 and I put it over here into an, into an investment, I did a loan, I did a mortgage, okay, and I did this, 
and I did it. And I'll tell you what I did. It was on Upper Captiva Island in Florida. A guy needed to buy a $330,000 piece of property and he needed a hundred thousand and I get first position and he's paying me 14% interest and two points. Okay. So that's what I did with the hundred grand. So do you think I really give a crud about paying the car guy 1% on one car, 2% on the other car when I have this other deal over here that I was able to put that hundred thousand dollar in that's going to give me 14% and he pays me interest every quarter. He's paying me interest only. And I have, I'm in number one position of a 320 or $330,000 piece of property. Now I'm not saying that's for everybody and that's what you should do. Not at all. Not at all. I'm just saying I understand this and how it works and how to keep money in motion. And I will use other people's money when the terms and the situations are right. It all just depends on the environment and what's going on. Does that help, Chris? Yes, it does. Got a bunch more questions, but I'll just let you keep going and then we'll come back to some of these. Okay. Um, so the next thing I'm going to go through is, so let's see who uses this strategy. Let's take a look. Who uses this? Well, this is how the University of Michigan pays their head football coach, Jim Harbaugh, right? I remember I was in Denver, Colorado, about to go up on stage and present this concept live. And I got there a little early. It was a morning presentation and I had some time. And, and again, so kind of like I do every day. Well, I haven't been the last couple months, but almost every day I like to go to ESPN.com and look at the sports scores and see who won, see what's going on in the sports world. So I go up to ESPN.com and this article is up there. And it says, if you see there on the top left, November 16th, 2016. And anyway, just to give you a high level, what the University of Michigan does is they're paying Jim Harbaugh, their head football coach, his salary through this life insurance policy. Well, why would they do that? Is the University of Michigan stupid? No, they knew it. They do it because they know they can get all the money back. They can pay him a big salary and get all of the money back. The same way we show you how to get money back for products and services, you can do this for your employees, right? I mean, payroll. Same exact thing. So I encourage you to go check that out. Joe Biden, whether you love him or hate him, look what it says there on the top left. Biden says he has no stocks, bonds, or savings accounts at all. And then go down in the middle. Biden has, he says, um, in addition, he holds six life insurance policies with Mass Mutual. That's one of the companies that Chris and I write with is Mass Mutual. We write with one of five, and that is one of them. And so, okay, again, here it is, your vice president, your former vice president, maybe you're the future president, um, he is actually practicing this. He has six life policies. Why does he have six and not just one? Well, remember what Nelson Nash says, this is about a system of policies. It's not about one policy, it's about a system of policies. Walt Disney, you guys ever heard of Disney World? Walt Disney wanted to start Disneyland, but after failing in the pursuit of traditional means of financing, in other words, here's what that means. After failing in traditional means of financing, in other words, Walt Disney went to a bank, tried to get a bank loan from a, from a banker, and the bank's banker said, you know, no, I don't think so. I don't think you qualify, you know? But, it, it, and then on top of that, he had to go through the thing that I call a proctology exam of trying to get approved for a mortgage or a loan. Have you guys ever tried to go get a bank loan? I mean, how hard is that? And isn't it a little funny and strange how the banks come running to you when you no longer need them to borrow from, right? The banks will come running to you and saying, hey, do you want to take a loan? But back when we needed to take a loan and we needed to use a bank, the banks weren't there to help us out. Isn't that a little crazy? It's absolutely crazy. So the banks need you more than you need them, all right? Especially when you start building your wealth and you're building money. So anyway, Walt Disney, what did he do? See that word collaterally? He put his policy up for collateral and borrowed money from the general fund of the insurance company. Ray Kroc with McDonald's, same thing. Same story as Disney, basically. I'll let you read it. But he borrowed money to help cover salaries of key employees. He also used some of that money for advertising campaign of that mascot we all know of today as Ronald McDonald. All right. Stanford University out in California. Well, there you go. His wife lost their son in memory. They started the Leland Stanford. Following Leland's death, his wife tried to sell her jewel collection. 
but couldn't raise enough money to save the university. She then used her husband's policy proceeds to avoid closure during a dangerous six-year period of financial distress. Look, guys, I want to hone in on this right here. I want to hone in on this. Look at the last sentence. She then used her husband's policy proceeds to avoid closure during a dangerous six-year period of financial distress. Right now, tell me what do we got going on in the economy? What's going on in the environment, right? We got this Chinese virus going on, yes. So things are shut down. We got the, right, we got the coronavirus. Everything is shut down, closed down. Um, and people are out there struggling. I get it. They're, they're struggling because they don't have the money. They don't have money coming in. You are now starting to see that most families, and a lot of you may be on this call, I hope not, or well, actually, uh, and again, if this is you, I hope you're on this call, or, if it, or I'm sure you know somebody that is, that they are one, two, three, four paychecks away from being homeless. Does that make sense? One, two, three, four paychecks away from being homeless, meaning that if your checks don't continuously come in from your job or your work or your employer, what in the hell are you supposed to do, right? Who's going to, who, I mean, because you, you guys are cutting things so close. With this method and this concept Chris and I are teaching you, you don't have, it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to be in those situations anymore. You have to start paying yourself first. Remember last week's call? Rule number one, pay yourself first. Pay yourself first and then pay everybody else. You have to start keeping control of your own financial, your own financial life, and you have to build your own family financing and banking system because I don't think this is the last time we're going to see something like this. It may be the last time in my lifetime, and I'm going to be 53 this year. You know, I hope it is, but it may not be. But what about our kids, our grandkids, future generations? What's going to happen? We're going to get in situations like this again, right? I don't want to see, and again, this is my duty, and, I, and again, I love getting up every day to teach this stuff, and even more so now than ever, because I want to help people break the bonds of financial slavery they don't even realize they're in, and start taking control of their own wealth and their own money. So you've got to have a system. You've got to have a process. You have to have a concept to start taking control of your financial life. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I don't know of a of another system. I don't know of any other concept or system that works this good with these features and benefits. I've been looking for it for 14 years. And if you can find something that works better than what Chris and I share with you, then let us know just what it is. All right. Then we have JC Penny. Same thing. The stock market crash. Oh, you ever heard of that? Stock market crash. 1929, Great Great Depression. So it devastated the stores and, and J.C. Penney's personal wealth, but he was able to borrow against the cash value of his policies to help the company meet payroll and day-to-day -day expenses. The company eventually rebounded. Even if you're a business owner and you own this and you, and you see this and you own a business, I know a lot of you guys, you're like, you hate it because you can't pay your employees. It sucks. It sucks because you would rather pay your employees, a lot of you, than you pay your own self but you can't because where's the money coming from? You can't bleed a turnip, right? So as a business owner, don't you want to set your business up to where when we do go through something like this, you can not only keep care of yourself, but you can also keep care of the people that work for you, the people that depend on you. So anyway, I get a little um, crazy about that. So um, I'll get off of that soapbox. All right, next thing I want to go in, let me have Hannah bring up. I want to show you because we're going because of what an average rate of return is versus an actual rate of return. So as Hannah's pulling that up, Chris, let's take a couple more questions if there is any. All right. So one of the questions we have is is the policy or insurance company backed or secured by the government or the state? Do you think, uh, and then it just says, don't think that would be the case, but by any chance, could anyone lose their money or the whole thing? I know the answer, but let, let's, hear, let's hear that from you. Okay, I'm going to answer it the way I do, Chris, and then you're, you can just take over um, because you're a little more detailed on this than I am. 
But anyway, so like the insurance companies, these are mutual insurance companies, right? They're not stock companies. They're not regulated by the federal government. They're state regulated. In an insurance company, $1 has to protect $1, okay? It's not like fractional reserve banking, where a bank can have a dollar on hand and they can loan out six, eight, ten, twelve dollars for every dollar they have on hand. You cannot do that in an insurance company. The, the insurance company has to have the money on hand when death occurs. There was something that I just looked at, I think it was a couple weeks ago with one of the insurance companies. And, it, and um, I think it was Mass Mutual, if I remember right. Now, don't quote me exactly on the numbers I'm about to give you, but it was, it was something like this. And so here's what happened is, is that if a Mass Mutual had to pay out every single one of their insured people, like all the people that Mass Mutual has insured, if they had to pay death benefit on every one of those, and if they all died today, Mass Mutual would be able to pay all the death claims, plus they would have an ex excess of 20 billion, B with a billion, $20 billion of cash still on hand. So those were pretty powerful numbers, I thought. I didn't realize that until I heard that. But all the insurance companies are, are like that. Now, I don't know of, of all of them and what the number is, and I might be a little off on the mass mutual, but it was a big number. But the insurance companies are state regulated. Now, see, okay, so the insurance companies, what they do, whenever you pay them premium, here's what the insurance companies do with that money. They put usually about around like about 80% of that money, they go out and they put it into investment grade bonds. Another 7% they do in home mortgages. Another 7% they do the policy loans for their policy holders. And another 7% has to be sitting in cash. So when death occurs, they have to be able to pay that death benefit off, right? They have to be able to pay the death benefit. And when you own a policy in a mutual company, you see, it's not like a stock company where the stockholders make the profits and the dividends. You, because you are, because it is a mutual company, you share in the profits and the dividends. So that money comes back to you in a form of a dividend. And once that dividend is declared, that dividend cannot be retracted. And all the companies that we work with have been paying dividends consistently, consecutively, without fail, for over 100 consecutive years. There's only one that we work with that's been paying dividends for 97 years. But everyone else is 100 plus years without fail. But even if the insurance company doesn't pay a dividend, you are still have that guaranteed growth rate in your policy contract. So the dividend is above and beyond what the guaranteed growth rate is of the policy. And I'll end it with this. Um, I lost my train of thought. Hang on, it's coming back to me. Uh, um, in a mutual company, you are the owner of the, oh, here it is. There is no mutual insurance company that I have heard of, or a, or a, or actually just an individual that owns a whole life policy in a mutual company that has lost money. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, well, what about AIG, Brent? Uh-uh. AIG lost it on the investment side, not on the insurance side, the investment side. And they're not mutually owned. Okay. Here's another thing I want to put out about that. Just I've been in this industry since 2003. Insurance companies also are, they have state insurance funds that back the insurance companies. And there's also federal funds. I hate to, you know, say it's anything even like the FDIC, but that's why AIG was bailed out. Now, AIG is a publicly traded mut uh, company, not a mutually owned. Mutuals very rarely ever go out of business. I, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find them. But here's another thing too, just to kind of give a little uh, boost to Mass Mutual because that's one of the companies we do right with. Last year, sometimes you got to think these companies might know something we don't know. Last year, Mass Mutual sold their investment arm. Many of you know of the company. It's called Oppenheimer Funds. They sold this last year to an investment firm called Invesco for $5.7 billion. Now, they did this because they wanted to, number one, capitalize on their investment arm, which was at the top of the market when they sold it. But secondly, they took those proceeds and the way they structured that deal with Invesco, those proceeds are now being used to support and kind of provide security for the future dividends. So future dividends are now kind of 
partly backed a little bit by that uh, that sale of 5.7 billion because of the way they did that. I mean, that right there just shows you how smart these mutually owned insurance companies are and how they're always looking out to make sure that that dividend is paid out to their policyholders for a very long time. And Mass Mutual's never once missed one dividend for 163 years, I believe it is. And that can be the case for every one of the companies we use. They all have impeccable, like consistent and predictable dividend scales across the board. And Brent, I got a, I got a couple more here. Let's see. I mean, Leo's always saying that every time he talks about life insurance to people, they always turn the other way. Well, ah. I, yeah, I'm going to let you answer that one. Yeah. I always read. I always <laughs> that question, Leo. All right. Now I'm going to be like a pit bull going after a T-bone steak after that question. So hold on. Let's hold that before the pit bull comes out of the cage. Let's get Eric's question. You stand to increase your cash value as well through compound interest. So as long as you pay yourself back greater than the policy loan interest. So he's referring to, you know, what you were saying earlier with, you know, bank loan versus use your Whoa. Bank loan versus using your money. But yeah, that's more or less just, you know, that's that control thing. So all right, let the pit bull out of the, out of the cage. Okay, can you repeat Leo's question one more time, just so I, I want to make, just so I, I'm 100% on it. Sure, he says, people turn the other way the second he mentions life insurance. Got it. Absolutely they do, because everybody, it's, it, look, so anyway, Leo, I'm a chiropractor, right? I mean, chiropractors are on every corner of the, of the town just about, right? So life insurance is a word that we hardly ever even talk about. We don't even bring up the word life insurance, you know, in the beginning of the conversation. The life insurance is just the vehicle that we're able to use. Whenever you talk about the word life insurance, people already think that they know everything there is to know, which they don't, but they think they know everything there is to know. There's a page in Nelson's book. I'm going to have Hannah pull it up right now. It's called The Arrival Syndrome. It's in the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And I want you to read that. And what Nelson says, he says, look, some people just can't be taught new stuff. They think that they know everything there is to know about a particular subject and they have arrived. And it's on page number 34 of Nelson's book called The Arrival Syndrome. Well, first of all, if I'm talking to somebody about this banking concept and they're asking me the question that they may ask, they say, well, what kind of work do you do? I mean, yeah, I sell life insurance. You can buy a life insurance policy from me. So I can say, oh, I sell life insurance, right? But no, I don't say that. Here's what I say. Here's the thing I say. And it's basically the first thing that Nelson says, he says on his audio, uh, on the audio version of his book. How about if there's a way that I can show you how to build wealth through your own debts and expenses that you already have, all by simply adding one step in your financial life. For example, so that car that you bought over there, John, so that's a nice car. I bet that set you back a pretty penny, right? Now, I don't even know you, John, but I, but I bet I know how you paid for that car. You either bank finance it, you paid cash for it, or you leased it, right? And he says, yeah, one of those answers. Well, here's what you had to do, John. No matter how you paid for that car in those three, um, just in those three scenarios, you had to give the money to the car dealer. The car dealer gave you the car. So he's got the car. Or I'm sorry, so anyway, the car dealer has the money, you have the car, everybody walks away happy, the transaction is, is done. Well, that money is gone, it's left your family forever. How about if there's a way, John, that I can show you, not only can you get the, all right, so not only can you buy the car and get the car, but now there's a system to get all the money back. How would you like to, to know that? If, if I could show you how to do that, is that worth an hour of your time? Is it worth 45 minutes of your time, an hour and a half of your time, whatever it is, right? Now, who's going to say no to that, right? So then I'll go into, and if he asks more questions, you know, I then will send them. I say, look, so this concept is way outside of the box. It's like riding the backward bicycle. I'm not going to be able to sit here and explain it to you in 10 to 15 minutes. You're just not going to get it in 10 to 15 minutes. So I want you to go watch this recorded version of this presentation. And again, you can take them to any of my 10 sections and you can take them to the car example if you just want to show them that. But if, if, if somebody sees the car example and they see how you can recycle and recapture the money for the cars that you're buying anyway, it's usually now they want to learn more. I don't even go into the whole life insurance side and I don't even talk about life and even 
okay, so even through my whole presentation that's an hour and 40 minutes long, how many times do I even mention life insurance? Not hardly at all. It's not that I'm trying to keep it. You know, I'm not trying to hide it because I do say it in the beginning. What is the, the way we're going to build our wealth? It's through a whole life policy and a mutual company that pays dividends and a life insurance company. But it's not the life policy that you know about. It's a specifically designed and engineered policy with high cash value that's going to give you high cash value immediately. Chances are you've never, ever even heard of this, this policy. You never even knew they existed. I mean, Chris Noggle on the call that's hosting the call that wrote the book with me, he was a financial advisor for New York Life for crying out loud for years. He didn't even know about this. He didn't know how this worked. True statement. Heard. So, yes. So, anyway, Leo, don't you don't go right in and say, let me tell you everything there is to know about life insurance that you don't know. No, that's a way to get you to – to, to run they'll run fast you know and again guys listen this is a concept again okay all right so there's nothing that we're selling all right i'm I, again i'm just going to take a guess that the, the guy that asked this question leo is an agent and he's talking to other people about life insurance i'm just going to imagine he's probably an agent and he's talking to his clients about life insurance no we're talking to them about the process, the concept of what we can do, this wealth building vehicle that the super wealthy have been using for the last 200 years. The Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Barclays, all those people I just showed you who uses this strategy. The vehicle, the machine is the life policy. If there's a better vehicle than this, then, then tell us what it is. But the real thing should be that people are asking is, hey, I have a problem, and how can you solve my problem? I have a money problem. I have a finance problem. I want to build more wealth. I, I should be getting more of my money back. I don't like banks getting all my money. All of that stuff. You are a problem solver. You're teaching people this. I never, and again, I know I got a lot of clients probably on this call right here. Out of all my clients that are on this call, have I ever came to you and said, and I said, hey, um, how would you like to buy a life insurance policy? So would you like to buy a life insurance policy? No, I don't ever ask you. Even when we go through this, I just say, hey, you got any more questions? Is there anything else you got? Any other questions? And if you say no, I say, all right. If uh, you want to move forward, let me know. Or I might say, okay, is this something you want to move forward with? Or, or so do you need more time to do more research or whatever it is? Even if they tell you that they need more time to do more research, I mean, it's going to take you a month before you can start the policy anyway. Even if you tell me right now you're ready to go, you can't start yet. First of all, I have to get you approved. It is not a right for you to own an insurance policy. It is not a right. It is a privilege. Just because you want one of these things doesn't mean you're necessarily allowed to have one, right? Not everybody can have these. People, I mean, Chris, tell them. How many people do just get turned down and denied for, for different reasons, yeah, right? Yeah. So not everybody can have one. So stop driving this thing home about life insurance. The life insurance, like I said earlier, it's the icing on the cake. It's the cherry on the icing. What we're doing is we're teaching people how to build wealth, how to create their own family financing system, how to keep control of their money, how to recapture, recycle all the dollars back from all the stuff that they're spending anyway. Well said. One more here from Dan. He says, does it, and, and I get this a lot and you know, there's different ways to answer it and there's more to this question than just the simple answer, but it says, does it make sense to pull money out of an old 401k in the form of a loan to put into one of the policies to gain control of our money? Uh, I know we pay ourselves back for the loan on the 401k, just wondering if it makes sense or any sense financially. Um, I don't know if you want to answer that one. I mean, there's a lot more that I'd need to know about this situation to be able to answer that. But the general answer, if you've got a 401k and you can take a loan, then does it make sense to put it into this vehicle and put it, you know, and use the vehicle to pay the loan back? Yeah, Chris. Um, anyway, so my answer to that is I don't recommend people go and pull money out of their 401ks to start policies, right? That's a, that's a decision that you are going to make down the road, not in your first policy. Now, we do have um, a scenario where we'll show in one of our later uh, series where you can actually borrow, where you can actually borrow from the policy. Um, or again, I'm sorry, the thing you can do is borrow from the 401k to help fund your policy, okay? And then we show you how 
you can get all the money back in the 401k without skipping a beat and you're able to use the money to jumpstart a policy. Now, again, talk to your tax advisor, your CPA or whatever about taking money out of the 401k. There is there are tax consequences, you know, by doing that. There could be penalties if you're at a certain age. Me personally, I'm not putting money in a 401k. I'm not putting money in an IRA. I'm not putting money in a qualified plan. I am not doing it. And when I learned about this, I stopped putting money into that plan. I put money. We were putting money into my wife's 401k. I stopped it. Um, and me personally, I ended up taking all the money out of that plan, paying the taxes and the penalties. And um, I, I don't have anything to do with that anymore. So that is, is, that's just me personally, but it may not be right for you. Here's the three questions I would ask. Who's controlling your money, you or somebody else? Are there any guarantees with your 401k or your IRA? Well, no, there's no, well, there is one guarantee. It's guaranteed to never go below zero, but how exciting would that be if that actually happened? Now, I'm gonna ask you three questions. Is a dollar worth more today or in the future? It's worth more today. And if you ever forget that, think about how many candy bars you could buy 20 years ago for a dollar, how many you can buy today? Are taxes gonna go up or go down? Yeah, they're going to go up. The history shows that they're going to go up. And tell me now, because of what we're going through right now in the environment, what do you think is going to happen to taxes in the next five years or whatever? Yeah, somebody's got to pay for all of this. Who do you think it's going to be, right? Question number three, if you have a choice to pay tax on the small amount of the seed or the large amount of the harvest, which one do you want to pay tax on? That's right. You want to pay tax on the seed, the small amount. Well, when you put money into a 401k, an IRA, a qualified plan, you're violating all three of those answers. Because what you're doing is you're giving up good dollars today to get paid with weaker dollars in the future. You're compounding the tax because the tax is always going to be there. And when you do pay the tax, you're going to pay it at the higher rate and not the lower rate. So I'm just trying to get you to think about exactly what's going on. But yeah, that's question. It'll entail a more of a detailed call as far as what you are actually doing um um yeah yeah I, i'm I'll, I'll i'll chime in i'm really good with how 401k loans work the rules the ins the outs and how they can apply so if you want set up a call with me at the three you know just text chris to 33777 and i can answer that a, a, you know a more intimate and more kind of as it relates to your specific situ situation yeah, it's no good. All right. So we have any more questions? I know we're getting to the end. We always, I always have more stuff than, than I um, have here. Uh, Just or, a, a simple question that wouldn't be bad to mention, but can Canadians own this insurance? Absolutely. We have partners up in Canada that can help set this up. Yes. And let's see. What about the tax issue? So Lynette, I guess I'm, I might be missing part of, your comment there in terms of what you were asking. Then I got two more here, Brent. Oh, well, okay. Hey, on Chris, the tax thing. I, yeah, I, I think you maybe asked that and we didn't answer it. So let me just say this about the tax. The way we're talking to you about these policies, okay? Everything that we're doing in the policy, we're talking about after tax dollars, which is a great thing because what you want to do is pay tax on your money one time one time only, and you want to get it into a tax-free environment, and you want to get the government out of your hair, okay? Now, so now, so after the money is in the policy, we've already paid tax on it. Well, when you take a loan, okay, a loan is never a taxable event. Have you guys ever paid tax on a loan? No, never. As a matter of fact, it's possible to get a deduction by taking out a loan because you have an interest expense and it's possible you could deduct the interest expense depending if it's going for a business purpose or not. I mean, ask your CPA about that. And the tax, uh, okay, so the tax itself on the death benefit, um, so there is no tax on the death benefit. So what we're doing is is we're, we're getting the money in a tax-free environment and it's growing tax-free. And the key word here is loans versus withdrawals. Everything we're talking about is we're talking about taking out loans. We're taking loans. We're putting our policy up for collateral, taking a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. If you withdraw the money from your policy, withdrawal, which I don't suggest that you do, there's very few situations 
where I would say, hey, maybe you want to withdraw and not a loan, okay? But if you withdraw, you will have to pay tax at ordinary income above the cost basis. So hypothetically, let's say you put in $100,000 into the policy. That's what you paid into the policy. Like during the life of the policy, you paid $100,000 of premium. Well, that money was put in there with after-tax dollars. You already paid tax on it. Well, let's say if you have $150,000 that you withdraw from the policy, now you're going to be taxed on that $50,000, right? Not the first hundred because you've already paid tax on that, but you'll be taxed on the fifty. dollars That's if you take a withdrawal. Policy loan, it's a whole different ballgame. All right. So another one is – so. I think there's just a little misconception. Leo was saying, so it's not a good idea to pull a home equity out to put $100,000 to start your own banking policy. But I don't think we said it wasn't a good idea. We actually, <clears throat> I'll answer this. Leo, we're going to be covering this, uh, I believe, in the believe next, next week's training on how to use home equity lines of credit for starting the banking policy. So I'll defer that question to next week because we're definitely going to go very deep into that question. Uh, let's see. I've got another one down here. How could someone with no experience in this kind of thing and really not any money to play with, how could they participate? Well, here's what you have to do. You got to get in the pool if you're going to learn how to swim. You're not going to be able to learn how to swim by standing at the pool deck. All right. Now, again, I'm not going to throw you in the deep end and don't want you to jump into the deep end. We're going to start. We're going to put some, um, what do they call those things on your arms? Those little flippers or floaties. And we're going to put you in the baby pool. We're going to get your ankles wet. We're going to get your feet wet, then your ankles, then your knees, then your hips, right? So you have to start. You have to make a decision to pay yourself first. Now, so anyway, so whoever asked that question, I want to ask you, how much are you worth? How much do you think you're worth? How much are you willing to pay yourself? Are you worth $2.50 an hour. And you're probably thinking, well, of course I'm worth $2.50 an hour. I'm worth way more than $2.50 an hour. Okay. Well, let's just say that you're worth at least $2.50 an hour. So what that means, you got to pay yourself first $2.50 an hour. Well, how many hours are in a work, work week? 40. Well, if there's 40 hours in a work week at $2.50 an hour, that's 100 bucks a week, $400 a month or $5,000 a year. So are you willing to pay yourself first $2.50 an hour. You're probably thinking, well, Brent, since you put it that way, I'm probably not worth $2.50 an hour. Okay, what about a buck twenty-five then? A dollar twenty-five an hour. A dollar twenty-five is how much? 40 hours a week, 50 bucks a week, um, $200 a month, $2,500 a year. If you do not think that you're worth at least a dollar twenty-five an hour to pay yourself first, then just the thing I would suggest is you save this presentation. You save these recordings and come back and talk to us when you think you are. You have to pay yourself first. See, up to this point, guys, a lot of you, here's what you're doing. You're paying everybody else because here's what happens. Whenever you get money that comes in, that money comes in. I don't care how you make it, active income, passive income. I don't care if you make $10 an hour or $10,000 an hour. Here's what you do with your money. When that money comes in, guess what you do with it? I told you to pay yourself first and you've heard it, but you don't, but you forget it or it goes in one ear and out the other. Here's what you do with your money. The thing you do is you pay the house people, the car people, you pay the student loan people, the travel, the food, the entertainment, the gasoline, the taxes. You pay for Bobby's piano, Bobby's soccer practice, Susie Piano's lesson, and you hope there's money left over for you. You have to start paying yourself first. If you're not willing to pay yourself first, then I want you to go to your backyard, take a shovel, I want you to dig a hole, crawl in the hole, have someone cover you up because you are just, you're just buried. You, you, you are going to be, you're going to be a, a slave to finances for the rest of your life and to other people. You need to start taking control of your own money. So start as low as you can. And then once you start, once you see how this works, once you re start recycling and recapturing your money, you'll know when the right time is to come back and do more. Chris, so tell them how many people that you, that, that come back to you and say, man, this is working so good. I got to start policy number two or policy number three, or I need to put more premium in than what I'm doing because it's working good and I need to keep going and going and going. 
Yeah, there's a lot. So a lot of the people that I start with, they just want to dip their toe in it and they just want to see, well, does this really work as good as it says, as good as the video shows? And as soon as they start, and I just had one recently, he started and I think it was like two months later, he's like, wow, I really screwed up. I should have put more in. This happens all the time because, hey, I, we know it. this is a brand new concept. It's a brand new thing that you haven't seen yet. So of course you want to be you know, conservative. You want to just test the waters before you dive in head first. And hey, haven't you always learned that about swimming? Don't ever dive into the shallow end. Test it out first. This is the same thing. So I think the what is the number, Brent? Is it 91 or 93% of all of our members are, slash our clients? They, they all start their second banking policy in the first year. So yeah. that's because they undershoot. I, cool. Listen, I started my first one. I think it was like $320 a month. That was back in 2014 because that's all I had. I just didn't have any more money. I was buried in debt and I slowly started doing it. And I very quickly, as I paid debt off, I very quickly started my second one, my third, my fourth. Now I've got six and every year I'll add a new one. Maybe even twice a year if I have to. As, as much money as I free up that I don't have to give to everybody else, I'll take that money and I'll just keep that money and put it in my banking policies. And I didn't have to change anything in my life. Just naturally, I'm building wealth through the month, just taking back the monies that I was giving away to everybody else. That's how I've done this. And I've, I've moved moved it into real estate, into private lending, everything. Yeah, absolutely. So just to go back on those numbers, um, the thing is, if a client is with us longer than a year, 91% will come back and start more policies, right? And of those 91%, we have about 70% will come back before the first year is even up because they see how powerful this works, how effective that we work with them. And also when you start a second policy, so the reason a lot of people will start them before the first year is up is because on the exam, right? The health exam is usually good for a year. The questionnaire, the health questionnaire is good for six months. The health exam is usually good for a year. Now, not 100% of the time it's good for a year. It depends on people and underlying conditions and stuff, but that's why a lot of people will come back before the first year is up so they don't have to go through the exam process again.